Will all sergeants please start the recordings? PC recording started. Is the call recording started? It started. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your video. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silence. I repeat, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silence. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Hope. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Costa Constantinidis. I am chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Today, we will hold a hearing on intro 1947 a local law to amend the New York City Charter and the Administrative Code of New York City in relation to rent regulated buildings uh, and intro in 2072, a local law to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to greenhouse gas emissions reduction methods, outreach and education. In 2019, the New York, New York State made significant changes uh, in their laws affecting tenants. The Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 was enacted and provides protections for tenants from increases from major capital improvements or MCIs uh, under the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. If fewer than 35% of the apartments in the building are rent regulated, your landlord cannot receive an increase for a major capital improvement. In the past, landlords were able to receive permanent uh, reimbursement in rent for MCIs that often provided little benefits to the tenant. Additionally, in regard to emissions compliance of Local Law 97, buildings that contain even one rent regulated apartment may be eligible to install pre-approved energy efficiency measures in lieu of meeting specific re emissions reductions. Intro 1947 would ensure that buildings must contain at least 35% rent regulated units to take advantage of this alternative compliance measure, greatly expanding universe of buildings that must meet strict admissions reduction benchmarks. This local law will conform New York City's de definition of a rent stabilized building to state law. However, and this local law places no immediate burden on landlords and no immediate benefits in lure of tenants. Consistency with state law is the main benefit and rationale for enactment of this law. Going forward, this local law will help us conform with the, the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Intro 2072 amends the building code regarding reports required to be filed by an owner respecting compliance with the applicable buildings emissions limit established pursuant to local law 97 of 2019. This local law also requires by uh, reporting by the Office of Building Energy Emissions Performance or OBEEP regarding the methods used to meet emissions limits and total over buildings in occupancy category and compliance. Finally, this law requires outreach and education reporting and reporting on the details of the outreach and education made to building owners, operators, tenants, and public, respecting information, including information on financing and incentives. Uh, according to the Internet and Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Education promotes awareness, positive practices, and wide participation, uh, participation. An aware public is essential if politicians and decision makers expect to mobilize the necessary means and to, affect, to limit the effects of climate change. Education is inseparable part of response strategies so that people feel directly engaged and empowered to act. Uh, the target audience for climate education includes everyone. Additionally, the IPCC notes that many actions at local level can catalyze much larger impacts, and particularly encouraging more energy, uh, efficient use of energy. An environmentally informed population is essential to addressing and responding to climate change. 
That is the goal of my legislation and the only way to a sustainable future, um, especially when we see climate change impacting our world, um, Western part of our country in flames, the smoke burning so heavily you can see it from space and the smog from that drifting here. Uh, name storms, it, it, almost out of letters in mid-September and the wrath that those storms have wrought. Uh, the unbearably hot summers and extreme weather that we've had. We need to act and act yesterday on climate. We don't have time for half measures. We need to continue to move forward. Uh, so with that, I would like to begin by thanking the committee staff, our counsel, Samara Swanston, policy analyst, Nadia Johnson and Ricky Chawla, uh, financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer. I wanna thank all the sergeant at arms, all the technical staff from, who have been able to make this Zoom work so efficiently. Thank you all for all your work. I know this is not easy. It was not easy when we're doing it at 250 Broadway, and it is certainly not easy doing it uh, remotely. So I thank the Sergeant at Arms and all the technical staff who are making these Zoom hearing work. And of course, I wanna thank my legislative director and counsel Nicholas Wazowski uh, and my communications director, Terrence Cullen for all of their great work as well. With that, I will turn it over to our uh, committee counsel, Samara Swanston, to introduce and swear in witnesses. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm Samara Swanston, counsel to the Environmental Protection Committee. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. We will begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raised hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to four minutes, including responses. Oh, before we get started, Samara, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, a little more difficult over Zoom, but I want to acknowledge that Councilmember Levin is here, uh, Councilmember Menchaca, and Councilmember Yeager, all from Brooklyn, um, are here and present today as part of this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Costa. <clears throat> now, I will deliver the oath to the administration and we'll call on each of you individually to record your answers to be followed by your testimony. Please raise your right hands. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions, Mark Chambers? I do. And, uh, <clears throat> Chief Sustainability Officer, Gina Borka. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Constantinides and members of the Committee of Environmental Protection. My name is Mark Chambers and I'm the Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I am joined today by my colleague, Gina Bokra, the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Department of Buildings. We are here today to offer testimony on intro 1947 regarding certain rent regulated buildings and local law 97 uh, and intro 2072 regarding outreach and education for building decarbonization. Similar to what the chair said, we cannot ignore that we are in the midst of a generational crisis here in New York City. Uh, since March, more than 20,000 New Yorkers have died from confirmed or probable cases of COVID-19. Uh, more than 50,000 have been hospitalized and more than 230,000 have tested positive. Uh, an estimate for, from the Center of, um, for New York City Affairs places the number of jobs lost at over a million. We also know that the climate crisis and COVID crisis are closely linked. Uh, exposure to a PM 2.5 air pollution, which is the highest in low income black and brown communities here, uh, has shown to increase the likelihood of dying in case of COVID-19. Heat waves, which get hotter and seemingly longer uh, every summer, 
impact the same at-risk groups, uh, seniors, low-income New Yorkers without access to AC, and those with health conditions um, that COVID-19 does. Uh, and in the past weeks, wildfire smoke from the fires consuming the Western United States have changed the color of the skies here too. We must continue to fight for a more just and equitable and healthy and sustainable society. This year's Climate Week, uh, as a result, feels a little bit different from many others. Uh, we are gathering virtually uh, to celebrate our victories and discuss the hard road ahead. Uh, over the past year, we have been hard at work implementing the Climate Mobilization Act passed by Council, a key component of our work to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. The Department of Buildings has begun to develop its rules for Local Law 97 in collaboration with a very diverse uh, advisory board. Local Laws 92 and 94, which require new and sustainably renovated roofs to incorporate solar and green roofs, went into effect last year. Uh, in October, you will start to see uh, building energy grades roll out across the city. And by year end, you know, building owners should be able to pursue PACE financing and re receive support and guidance for an expanded retrofit accelerator. Our office is working to deliver studies to support decarbonization on topics ranging from the possibilities afforded by a carbon trading system to advance environmental justice to grid decarbonization in collaboration with our utility partners. Our team and agency partners are breaking new ground every day to work to reduce emissions. And with that, I'll turn to intro 1947. Intro 1947 would require that buildings over 25,000 square feet that have 35% or fewer rent regulated units comply with Local Law 97's emissions limits. Currently, these buildings are only required to implement prescriptive measures to reduce emissions like repairing heating system leaks and upgrading lighting. Um, and they're not required to meet strict greenhouse gas uh, emission limits. These buildings uh, were provided alternate compliance paths due to the council and administration's shared desire to protect rent regulated tenants in those buildings from the risk of increased rents because of building owners recouping their in retrofit investments directly from their rent regulated tenants. After Local Law 97 was passed last spring, the Housing Sustainability and Tenant Protection Act passed last summer at the state level removes the ability for landlords to pass on excuse me, to pass on capital costs to rent regulated tenants through major capital improvements or MCIs, um, the mechanism um, uh, in buildings for buildings with 35% or fewer uh, regulated units. We wanna make sure that as many tenants as possible can benefit from, from the improvements in livability, comfort, health, and efficiency that come from retrofits. And we also know that we need these large buildings to come into compliance with Local on 97 to meet our emissions reduction goals. The tenant protection law updates pre prevent landlords from passing on these costs of compliance to their rent regulated tenants. Therefore, we support the intent of 1947 and look forward to working with council to and stakeholders to make sure that we address any potential issues that they may identify. We want to implement and expansion responsibly and share the technical assistance and financial resources we've put in place with these buildings to help them comply with Local Law 97. Turning now to intro 2072, which requires the Department of Buildings to prepare annual reports um, regarding Local Law 97 of 2019, which regulates greenhouse gas emissions from buildings exceeding 25,000 square feet. The annual reports must include information regarding building owner compliance with Local Law 97 and information regarding the department's uh, efforts to educate owners and the public around reducing emissions from buildings and compliance with Local Law 97. We support this bill and share the council's goal of reducing emissions from buildings. This bill will help us monitor compliance with Local Law 97 and will shed light on strategies building owners are using to reduce emissions. The department also understands how important it is to conduct outreach and education to building owners who must do their part to reduce emissions and look forward to keeping council informed uh, of its efforts in this area. We are committed to their obligation under law. <clears throat> we, sorry, we are committed to conducting out, direct outreach to owners impacted by local, 90, local law 97 so that they are aware of their obligations under the law and so we can support them as they work towards compliance. We look forward to working with the committee on this issue. In closing, 
I would like to speak a little bit about um, someone that I met this summer whose name is Lillian. Uh, Lillian is in her 90s uh, and lives in upper Manhattan. Uh, we got to know each other when she called into the 311 call center uh, built and operated by a team that the Mayor's Office of Sustainability um, put together for the Get Cool NYC program, a program the city launched this summer to provide free air conditioners for low-income seniors along with our Department of Energy Man um, Emergency Management. Uh, she lives in a rent regulated unit in an older building that has air conditioner that has uh, an air conditioner that hasn't been functional in 10 years. Uh, like tens of thousands of other seniors, she faces serious health risks due to extreme heat and needs an air conditioner to stay healthy and home. Uh, but she also faced difficulty updating her AC because the wiring in her building is so old that it only has two pronged outlets. Uh, she needs better insulation, she needs new wiring, she needs more efficient climate control, all of the above, but she's not able to pay for that herself. Bringing her building into compliance with Local Law 97 would bring her those improvements and incidentally create and support jobs in the community to do that work. And intro 1947 would protect a tenant like her from having to carry those costs. We look forward to working with council to continue to implement policies that will confront the climate crisis in a way that truly benefits New Yorkers. Thank you. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Good to see you as always. Great to see you, sir. Good to be seen. Um, <laughs> Uh, so let me give me a second as I line this up correctly. All right. So why is it important to harmonize the city's definition of a rent regulated apartment uh, with the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act? Yes. Good. Did you hear me okay? Uh, I, the last part chimed out. Um, okay. Why is it important? So how, why is it important to harmonize the city's definition of a rent regulated apartment with the New York State Climate uh, Leadership and Community Protection Act? So one of the really critical factors to us being able to to move all of our buildings towards both compliance with local law ninety seven as well as um, the state in general is to make sure we're all using the same language so that we can actually change the, uh, the the market around being able to invest in the in, in this work so for us it's critical to be able to align these with a lot of the, the state goals to make sure that everyone is operating from the same um, the same manual and that making sure that we are being thoughtful and consistent so that we're sending the right message to both building owners as well as to the workforce that are going to be implementing uh, the needed changes uh, do you agree that it would make sense to get these buildings into the program earlier rather than later when the compliance dates are due? So it gives the building owners an opportunity to understand their obligations, understand um, the retrofit, work with the retrofit accelerator, understand the PACE program, under, be able to work with OB, um, and that delaying um, their introduction, you know, this sort of lining up with state law would only serve to hurt those landlords and hurt tenants, not actually help them. Yes, we want more people to be doing more work as soon as possible. I think that we we have been very clear about the, the need for urgency. We've set the timelines of compliance to align with the capital cycles of building owners uh, and meet them where they are. But it's very important that as many uh, buildings that can move towards um, compliance sooner uh, do so. And I think being able to communicate that and have as much um, education and, and clear um, uh, language around the services that are provided to assist building owners in doing so, it will be critical to ensuring their success. And what result would be any, what benefit is there to the tenants? Uh, you know, we talk about fighting big picture climate change, but what, what benefit are there to the tenants uh, in seeing these buildings become more energy efficient and cleaner? Well, I think it's important to understand that buildings that are more energy efficient perform better and are better to live in. They're more comfortable. So, you know, when you create, when you fix your windows, that means that the windows are no longer leaking air. It means that temperatures in, in apartments are staying consistent. They're staying warm when they need to be and cool when they need to be. All of these uh, improvements allow for uh, more comfort and control over the internal space for tenants so that they can actually uh, benefit from better indoor environments. 
And, and what are the difference in potential emission reductions under the current framework um, compared to if we added 1947? We believe right now we've only done some preliminary analysis just based on uh, some of the information that we've been able to put together. But we do believe that there is uh, about 100,000 so um, CO2 equivalent um, tons of, of carbon that would be removed as a result of this, uh, this addition. So we believe that this is something that is very significant and, is, and will have a, a significant impact on both the buildings that are now would be part of local 97 as well as the city as a whole as we begin to uh, reduce our localized emissions. Um, okay. And how many buildings do you believe that are would be captured by 1947? Again, initial estimates uh, put that in the neighborhood of about a thousand buildings or so. Um, that can that translates to maybe about a hundred thousand or so units. Um, but we believe it's in a neighborhood of about a thousand buildings. So a thousand buildings would reduce, uh, would get about a hundred thousand tons of carbon out of the air. Correct. If, if you your estimates. I mean, this is why we began with large buildings, correct? Because they were about 30% of our emissions profile for the city of New York. That's why we did local on 97. That's why we continue to strengthen it, correct? Absolutely. Correct. All right. And if you ask like where well, why are you going why are you beating with us we're not picking on anyone we're basically saying this is where the emissions are this is where we have to start right if we if we didn't start here we wouldn't be making the impact that we were able to really sort of gain correct absolutely we have to go to the the core of our climate response in this city is around buildings that is that is the the critical path to us being able to uh, to confront the challenges. There are a lot of other places where we have to fight too, but this is one that is uh, in, in urgently important for New York City to tackle. And we, you, you believe, and I, I guess Gina, you're on uh, from OBEEP. You're there as well. Um, I've said this in the past, and I'll say this again. Um, and I, this is more of a you can answer this question, but it's more of a statement. We don't want their money. We want their carbon, correct? So our, it's our job to make sure that buildings comply with the law, not pay fines. Yes, council member, that's correct. So to all the building owners out there, we don't want your money, we want your carbon. And we're, we're looking forward to working with you to make sure that we you, you that carbon is reduced. Uh, let's quickly just kind of go over to 2072. Um, what what will building owners be required to report under that local law? Gina, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, under 2072, uh, building owners are being asked to report how they're getting to the reductions that might move them from non-compliance into compliance. So that will benefit other building owners once they are able to see what measures are building owners implementing and employing and um, uh, use that information to educate others. And what data will you be, uh, OB, um, the Office of Building Energy Emissions Performance, but from this point forward in the hearing, we'll just call you guys OB. Um, what, what data will you guys be required to report? We'll be reporting information on the, the um, compliance levels, um, how many owners are complying with the law as opposed to how many owners are getting fines. Okay. And what kind of, why is it so important that we do education outreach, right? I mean, you know, I mean, that's a pretty easy question. I, I believe the importance of education, but why is it so important we educate as early as possible, building owners, tenants, the public in general, that's what we're doing. And so the real goals of this, this legislation. Uh, thank you, Council Member. As, as my colleague Mark uh, expressed, uh, we need action soon. Um, the, there are really great examples of how owners have um, achieved, achieved deep energy retrofits in buildings, how they've achieved um, high performance and reduced their own greenhouse gas emissions. We need to take that information and share it with other owners that are trying to achieve the same results. So the department is um, 
willing to work with council and uh, look at other ways to communicate uh, to owners, to the general public, and make sure that we can share the information that they need to improve the performance of their buildings and bring, hungry, bring down greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. All right, so with that, um, I know we have Council Member Yeager who has questions. I also want to acknowledge that Council Member Ulrich is here and he'll be next with questions after Council Member Yeager. Council Member Yeager, I turn it over to you, sir. Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you or virtually uh, see you. Uh, and Shana Tova, uh, Happy New Year, sir. Shana Tova to all. Uh, Mr. Chambers, good morning. I, I uh, have a couple of questions uh, related to as I turn off the noisemaker because I didn't pay attention to the sergeant. My apologies. Um, the, uh, I, I, you testified that a thousand buildings uh, consisting of a hundred thousand units uh, would be brought in under this law. Is that additional or is that the total number? Uh, additional to, to what exactly, council member? Additional to how the law is currently structured where- Yes. Uh, it's adi an additional 1,000 buildings. Correct. Do you know how many buildings of those thousand currently have only one regulated apartment right now? Uh, we do not. Uh, the a lot of this is in coordination with uh, with HPD, in which uh, there are some privacy rules around uh, the ability to know which buildings specifically have uh, percentages of of rent regulated units. We're happy to to continue to work with you and with HPD to provide whatever information um, doesn't. Uh, go afoul of those those privacy concerns. Okay. Does the city and the state know how many uh, rent regulated apartments are in a rent regulated uh, in, in a building? I mean, if there's if there's 30 units in a building and there's one rent regulated apartment, the city has that record. It's not there's no privacy issue on that topic. It's, I'm not asking for the names of the people. No, understood. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, we're happy to work along with you and and, and uh, housing and preservation to be able to provide the information that they're allowed to provide. I'm saying that. Okay, so you'll find that yeah. out for us. Not working with me. I don't have that access to information. I'm I'm a I'm a small country legislator. I don't have any information. <laughs> I'm running on the city administration. They work for you, not for me. So understood. Uh, I'd like to know that. And the reason why I think is it, it's important is because I do believe. Um, making an exclusion for a building that has but one rent regulated apartment is uh, too much of an exclusion, uh, frankly, because if a building has 100 units and it has one rent regulated apartment, the point was that we that we recognized as a government that it is that that buildings that are rent regulated are bringing in less income than, for example, market buildings, and therefore they have less money to play with, and therefore they have less ability to do the work. Um, going from an exclusion of one apartment, which was, I think, too much and captured too many buildings to uh, no more than 35%, I think is uh, a stretch because what we're talking about at that point is two thirds of the building um, uh, being market, you know, it's not a secret, the market apartments pay for uh, the, the the, the rent regulated apartments. Rent regulated apartments don't actually cover themselves. It's the market apartments that cover the rent regulated in many, many buildings, not across the board. But I think there's some place between one apartment and 35% that makes sense. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious also to know how many of, of the, uh, uh, you testified there's 100,000 units that would come with those thousand additional buildings. How many of those are affordable? And I think it goes along with the question of the one apartment versus 35%. I think we do need to figure that out because I, I think there's a right mix. I think there's a place to get to. I think that the chair is right that we, we have an admirable goal uh, and we need to reduce the, the, uh, the level of, of toxic noise uh, that, that's infecting people uh, their health, their, their, uh, their, their lives, and their ability to live in the city. But I also think that we, we have to be cognizant that- Time expired. Here, with your permission, if I may. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna hope that was a yes, Chair. Um, I think we have to recognize that there's someplace, there's, there's gotta be a mix where we have to make it that landlords can do this, that owners can do this. We can't set up a, regulate, a regulatory scheme that landlords simply cannot comply with. 
particularly what we're seeing right now are landlords that simply can't even pay their real property tax. Um, and we're forcing this additional piece onto landlords that have small buildings. I'm not talking about thousand unit buildings. I'm talking about a 30 unit building. Uh, well, very small landlords that have that issue that are not able to uh, comply. I've, I've, Mr. Chair, if I have your permission, may I go on for another minute or two? Uh, a minute, yes. All right, perfect. But don't forget, this, this law only applies to buildings only 25,000 square feet. Understood. That's the, okay. and, and, Great. And, so. uh, and things are 25,000 square feet as well. If only you and I lived in 25,000 square feet worth of property, but those are still <laughs> small buildings, given the larger buildings that there are in the city. Um, uh, Mr. Chambers, does the city have a program that helps uh, buildings pay, uh, with rent regulated units, pay for this kind of work that has to be done, uh, either through loans or through grants? Yes, so the, the, the city alongside uh, city council also passed legislation last year to uh, initiate PACE financing, uh, which is property assessed clean energy financing, uh, which is a program that uh, when fully enacted and that is should be up and running uh, shortly, uh, will allow for building owners to take out low interest long term loans, uh, which uh, have a much longer payback time cycle than your your um, your typical uh, loan and will allow for them to initiate the needed retrofits without having the upfront capital um, the, to begin. So it's a great program that also allows them to pay it back through their property taxes. And we've been working alongside the Department of Finance to um, to initiate uh, that loan process uh, for the city. So it's not ready yet, but but uh, but we expect that it'll be ready at some point soon. Correct. It'll be, yes, it'll be. It it should be ready um, uh, within this year. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the you know HPD financing is also available uh, for rent regulated buildings uh, through the Green Housing Preservation Program. So that's that is a currently existing uh, program that um, that exists. And again, alongside the previous questions, happy to work with HPD to provide any additional clarity or um, information on those programs. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I do, I do trust you'll be able to get that information to the chair. Um, and, and my last question is, do you know how much that program costs uh, the city uh, uh, once it gets up and running, how much it costs annually for the city to administer to run that program and how much it's costing the city, the city uh, in terms of the float between what the city has the money and the interest that it's gonna get back or does the city actually make money on it? No, so it, the, the, it's actually um, a program that is also initiated statewide. And so there's an administrator that connects the, um, the, uh, the, the financing to, to the building owners. The, the city's role in it is to collect the, the, um, the funds through the property taxes, but it is, a, it is a fund that kind of revolves back towards the, the administrator. So it is not something in which it is a revenue driver for the city. I'm happy to, again, provide additional information related to the PACE program, the coordination um, with the PACE administrator uh, and how the, the actual program works, but it's not a revenue driver for the city. Thank you very much. I don't want to try the chair's patience, so I'll, I'll hold back on everything else that I, I'd like to discuss, but I appreciate your time and your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You need to come back for a second. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Ulrich? I'm starts now. Hi, Mr. Chairman. It's so good to see you. I hope you and your family are in good health, and uh, I'm glad to see all my colleagues on the call as well. I want to piggyback, if I can, on some of the questions asked by my colleague, Councilman Yeager, uh, regarding the financing and the affordability of complying with the new law, uh, assuming that it's passed. The concern that I have is that uh, a lot of property owners um, right now, they can't go to housing court. If they have tenants that are not paying their rents, uh, they can't evict those tenants, but yet they're still being forced to pay water bills and property taxes and all the other expenses that go along with the maintaining and owning property in the city. It, given the decrease in revenue that they're having and that they're experiencing right now and the financial troubles that they may be going through, I'm just wondering, other than financing, you know, why the city isn't matching or putting up any of the money up in the form of grants to help pay for the capital cost of complying with the new regulations. I just, I, I know that this is a very admirable goal and I want to see it accomplished more than anybody, but I, I just don't want, I wonder why the city doesn't put their money where their mouth is. If the city really wants to see this happen, the city should put a match into place. And, and also the city should give people more time to comply with it. I understand 
that there's a provision of the bill that says uh, that basically would result in a rent regulated property owners um, having to comply 18 months sooner than commercial property owners. Well, there are lots of skyscrapers in Manhattan and other parts of the city that are commercial or mixed use that uh, would have to comply. And uh, they're gonna have 18 months more time than people who own strictly rent regulated buildings. So I'm just curious, maybe the bill sponsor can, can explain why uh, uh, the rent regulated apartment owners have to have 18 months less. And also I'm curious from the city's perspective, why the city didn't put any money up other than in financing to actually cover the upfront capital costs that are associated with complying with the new regulations. Certainly, I'm happy to answer unless the chair would like to respond before me. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Mark. Um, so I think that it's important to understand that uh, we are operating against a, a, a very significant imperative, right? We, we do have 10 years to be able to not only implement the changes required by this law, but the changes to kind of reverse significant impacts to uh, our, our planet um, related to greenhouse gas emissions. The way in which Local Law 97 was uh, conceived and ultimately passed by, by council uh, allowed for a, a 10 year timeline, five years and then, and then second compliance path um, ten, and, uh, uh, five years later to ensure that building owners had the time to be able to do this work alongside their capital cycles, making sure that uh, if you had a plan to, to change out your boiler five years from now, that's something that, that can work alongside your, your original plans. And the Department of Buildings has also been uh, setting up significant um, uh, apparatus to be able to assist owners, uh, meet them where they are and provide them all the information they need to be able to not just take out loans, but to other, seek other financing to comply and to look at all the operational changes that they might be able to make, which are not as, as, um, as significant as some of the, the larger capital investments. All in all, there is a, there's a commitment to make sure that building owners have as many options as possible and recognizing that they are not all um, going to have the same conditions in their buildings. So it's important that we provide as much um, information, incentive, and direction as possible to make sure that everyone is in compliance. And the financing that we provided and are providing through the PACE program is one of the clear ways to be able to do that, to make, ensure that building owners have options to be able to do that, along with the, the market options that are currently available to them. I just think that, that the market and the, and the PACE financing is not sufficient. That's what I'm suggesting, is that the city- I'm expired help cover the costs of the capital costs, which are significant for some building owners. I just think this is an, this is really a big burden, especially with COVID and declining revenue and tenants not being able to afford their rents. Where are they gonna get the money? I, I just, I don't think the financing is enough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Understood. Thank you. Um, so essentially, I mean, I'll just say this, is that this, there's no, I don't see any, I don't see anywhere in the law where it gives, you know, residential buildings less time than commercial. It does give less time to the worst emitters. And that's across the board, right? Commercial properties, every different type of property, the worst emitters have to go in 2024, which is the bill we voted on back in 2019. And then the, the rest of the buildings would have to comply by 2030. Um, so there we are looking at all different building types equally uh, in that they need to comply the worst emitters. Again, these are all buildings that are over 25,000 square feet that are captured by this law. This isn't a one family home. This is our, you know, these 50, these 50,000 properties, which are 25,000 square feet or above that are captured by this law only. I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Great. Uh, are there any other of my colleagues who have any questions for the administration? Councilman Yeager, do you have, do you want to come back for a second round? We have a new problem. Okay, I'm back. Yes, thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, look, Time I, starts I, now. I, I want to reflect on on uh, just two points, but I want to start with the following. Um, since my time in the council, this this council, this committee in particular, has been a leader um, nationwide on environmental protection, on saving the environment, on uh, being focused <coughs> on not just the present. And I think uh, I think that um, Chair, you, uh, the speaker, the council, 
have a lot to be proud of. And the administration has been a partner in many re respects in that way. But we are, as you said, uh, uh, and as Mr. Chambers testified, we are in unprecedented times. Um, and my concern is whether or not we're forcing something <clears throat> to, uh, down the pike uh, where, where we do have, unfortunately in this city, so many people who are not able to pay rent. Uh, and, and we have tried to address that in the council and in some ways perhaps uh, we're being successful because we're seeing some state action, but not enough. There are people in this city who can't pay their rent. Uh, and I don't, I don't see a way that we should force them or we could force them to pay their rent right now um, when they don't have jobs and they're not able to live. Uh, but that affects the landlord's ability to pay for his building. And when we are forcing something like this uh, down the throats of landlords, uh, the smaller ones are the ones that I'm concerned with. And 25,000 square feet may not sound like a lot if there's a building with a million square feet, but 25,000 square feet is a small building. It is. Um, and that's what I'm concerned about. I think a better way to do this, Mr. Chair, uh, and I know this is your bill and I, I have great respect, but would be to either phase it in over a longer period of time to get past the financial downturn. We are at the initial stages of one and it's going to last for several years. Uh, and uh, step number two, I think would be to perhaps phase in the percentage uh, moving far beyond the exclusion of just one apartment, which I think was, was uh, too much of an exclusion, but staying uh, lower than the 35%, which I think is, is too great. Um, but with that, I, I don't have any more questions for Mr. Chambers. I do appreciate his service and, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. Um, with that, I um, want to thank Mark Chambers and uh, uh, Gina Bacher as well from OB. Uh, thank you for your service to the city. I look forward to working with you uh, continuously on this legislation or the pieces of legislation, and I hope you and your family stay safe. Thank you, Chair. Same to you. Thank you, Chair. And now we'll turn to the public testimony. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike your typical hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. Now, first I would like to welcome Pete Sikora to testify followed by Rachel Rivera. Time starts now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Pete Sikora here with New York Communities for Change. Um, I'm also a member of the Local Law 97 Advisory Panel. Thanks for doing this hearing, particularly under the trying circumstances. Rachel just had to drop off because she has three kids uh, who are negotiating remote learning right now. Um, so we lost her two minutes ago. I apologize for that. I'm gonna try and combine our testimonies real quick here. Um, Rachel is a Sandy survivor who, uh, when the storm hit, heard a cracking sound from the roof of her apartment. Um, she grabbed up her little daughter in the night, um, pulled her off the bed. And a few minutes later, the roof came right down onto the bed. Um, they ran out into the night with nothing um, and became homeless and in the shelter system. Um, they are an example of why the climate crisis is imperative to deal with. Council Member Yeager, we very much appreciate your concerns about costs and how this can be handled, but we support this legislation very strongly uh, for, two, uh, for, for multiple reasons, but fundamentally because it takes on the climate crisis and creates good jobs it's also affordable to tenants and to landlords as well. Um, so we hope you support it and, and we'll, we'll uh, co-sponsor it. Um, but making this law happen uh, is uh, quite a challenge um, and a huge one that the city has to step up to. Um, so first I wanna say um, to the administration, 
we hear the thousand buildings. Um, that sounds slightly low to us, but this data is secret uh, from the state, so we don't know exactly. But our guess is it's uh, more than a thousand buildings um, out of the rent regulated population, but we don't actually really know. Um, that's based on our experience as organizers uh, in those buildings working with tenants uh, on landlord tenant uh, disputes usually. So um, it's a big deal, this law. It, uh, Local Law 97 creates tens of thousands of good jobs. Intro 1947 will create- Time expired. Um, by, I'm gonna take Rachel's time as well, if that's okay. Um, so is, is that all right with the extra two minutes? I'm rolling, okay. So um, so <laughs> it's, it's very much appreciated, very important topic here. Um, the, the, this bill will not create rent hikes for tenants because after you pass local law, 19, uh, local law 97, the state amended the rent laws to eliminate major capital improvement rent hikes for buildings with 35% or fewer rent regulated tenants. So that's why this legislation covers those buildings and requires that their uh, pollution limits be equal to the buildings that are not rent regulated, um, that are identical physically. There's nothing different about the buildings. There's nothing particularly uh, different from, from one to the other. So it makes sense to equalize those levels. And in fact, that's what elements of the real estate industry argued during the intro 1253 fight. They opposed intro 1253 in part saying that uh, requirements should be equal across rent regulated and non-rent regulated, um, which is ironic because now um, we're hearing through the grapevine that they're saying quite the opposite and that intro 1947 is unaffordable. Now we knew in the 1253 fight that that was a poison pill to say that, um, but, uh, uh, and now it's deeply ironic to, to say that uh, these requirements should not be equalized now that the state has changed its law. So um, we urge you to pass this legislation. I'll just say as a New Yorker, lifelong New Yorker, it just takes one look at a hurricane map uh, to see the vulnerability of the city. Right now, this city is on the verge of drowning while baking and being hit by extreme weather events over and over and over again. We will not make it through the climate crisis as a city. I wish that was hyperbole, it isn't. But we have an opportunity here to create good jobs. The council is leading um, and the mayor is supporting this as well. And it's an incredibly worthwhile uh, initiative to help Time expired. building a Green New Deal for New York. So thank you for taking this up and holding this hearing. And we hope you pass intro 1947. Um, I submitted prepared testimony as well from both of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Yeager, you have your hand raised for questions, sir. Thank you. There's a little uh, delay on the unmuting function. Mr. Sikora, uh, I'll be real quick. I don't have a question. I just, I just want to respond uh, to your initial statement. First of all, thank you for your service, uh, for your good work uh, on leading in this battle. Um, I agree with you, and I agree with the work that you're doing. It, it is important. Uh, it's necessary, and uh, you're right that we, we do have uh, you know, a time clock facing us on, on our ability and our desire and our will uh, to address uh, the, the, the current health status in New York, which a lot of it has to do with emissions. Um, I do support this bill. Uh, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not co-sponsoring it now because I have a concern about the 35% being too high, but I do support the bill. I do support the concept. I do think we can do better than one apartment exclusion that had been in the original version. Um, I'm not going to respond either way on, on, you know, grapevines because I don't do grapevine stuff, but uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what others think about, um, you know, what's good and what's bad. My concern is whether or not we're forcing something early that, that owners are not able to afford. I want owners, especially because they are not, you're right, that the cost is not going to be passed along to the tenants now because MCIs are no longer passable. I like that, except for the fact that that also means that landlords are going to have to decide, do we do windows? Do we do this? Do we do painting? Do we do basic repairs to a building? Are we able to keep a, a maintenance person on staff or do we have this, this uh, you know, clock facing us of doing this work to get into compliance with the law? And that's why I think that if we structure a little further into the future, maybe by even a year or two, um, and if we brought, drop the 35% a little bit, just to make it more manageable 
or maybe structure when the percentages kick in, I think we should do it. Ultimately, the goal should be 100%, right? Not 35%. Every building ev across the board ultimately should be uh, skewing forth only stuff that doesn't hurt us. Um, and that should ultimately be the goal. The question is how you structure it and how you get there. That's just my reflection, uh, but it's not a disparaging uh, remark in any way on the work that you're doing. And, and I just want to make sure you know, I do support the concept, I do support the bill, uh, just not there yet on, on exactly how it's worded. And with that, Thank Mr. You Chair, so much I, for I, I support, yield back. Council member. Real quick, I think you're raising a very important issue here of affordability for the building owners. And I want to reinforce something that the chair was saying that these are the most high polluting buildings uh, that are taken in in 2024. And that means that they're probably the most inefficient. And so they have the easiest, lowest cost opportunities to actually save themselves money and cut their emissions at the same time. So for a lot of these buildings, um, they're going to be actually able to save money net, especially with all the financing up front, uh, paying their cash costs. So, you know, this is a, a big opportunity for the city. Um, obviously, there's uh, many, many different types of buildings across the city, but your typical owner is going to be able to comply with this law. Uh, and save money out of it. And so, Mr. Sakar, maybe the, you know you're making me think of a point. Maybe there's a way to do this as as a means testing, where buildings can somehow uh, figure out a way that if they are not, I mean, there are buildings right now that have seen a 50% or more reduction on their rent roll. Maybe 60, maybe 70, some buildings. Maybe there are buildings that if they're doing better, uh, if they show a financial statement showing that they're doing better, they won't get exempted. But if they're a building that's actually hurting, they can actually go to the city and say, look. Can we be excluded for an extra year or two? Because right now we're not getting the rent that we need in order to make these payments. The point about the financing is that it's not free. Um, if the building doesn't have the money in its pocket and they turn to the city to pay for it, what do they need to cut in order to make those payments if they're not carrying their own costs right now? There are buildings right now, the smaller ones, I'm talking, not talking about the large you know, uh, portfolios of real estate. I'm talking about small owners that are simply not able, they're, they're dipping into assets to pay for their expenses. They're not dipping into income. We want buildings to be able to pay for this out of income and for capital improvements, obviously to pay for it out of assets. But if they don't have enough income to pay for their operating expenses right now, my concern is whether or not they'll have enough money to do this work. We want them to run safe, efficient buildings. We want them to keep their doors functioning, their locks functioning, their windows functioning, their stairwells functioning, and to make their buildings safer for the health of the community. Hopefully, I think we can get to that mix. I'm hopeful that the chair would, would figure out a way with us that we can get there. Yeah, that, that's great. And there's a there's in the legislation in Local Law 97, there's a process for buildings that truly face economic hardship here to uh, apply to the Department of Buildings. So, um, but again, it's, it's going to be a value proposition for most building owners. So thank you again. And thanks so much for all of your support over the years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to back and forth. I appreciate it. I'm trying to make this as realistic a hearing as possible, despite the Zoom. All right. Um, next, <clears throat> I would like to call Sonal Jessel of WEAC, whose testimony will be followed by Michael Scott, also of WEAC. Time starts now. Uh, hi, um, my name is Sonal Jessel. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Chair Constantine, for all of your great allyship and the other council members that are here. Um, so I am the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at WE Act for Environmental Justice. Over the past 31 years, 32 actually now, WE Act has been combating environmental racism in Northern Manhattan. I myself have received my Master in Public Health from Columbia University. So I'm here as an advocate excited by the potential to pass this bill to expand climate mitigation significantly. Local on 97 put New York City on the map, leading U.S. and global response to the climate crisis. And we know that reduction in building emissions for large buildings is the kind of action we need to ensure we keep warming at 1.5 C. I mean, meaning um, to avoid catastrophic impacts for all of us. That's what this is doing. <laughs> Since buildings are number one polluter in New York City, it's a perfect target. Now that we have stronger tenant protections, thanks to the rent laws, New York City can further expand the Colon 97. Building pollution contributes greatly to poor air quality in New York City, 
And it's the communities of color and low-income communities that have borne the brunt of that poor air quality. And that's because of the historic systematic environmental racism that has placed industrial sites, bus depots, waste transfer stations, sanitation truck depots, and more in communities of colors. I mean, all bus stations in Manhattan are uptown, for example. On the top of that, it's the communities of color that have larger rates of buildings using dirty fuel, buildings that are simply inefficient. And while Local on 97 expansion is good for everyone, it has the potential to positively impact those communities of color greatly. And specifically, I know we're talking about these big buildings, um, but overarchingly, that's kind of where we're headed with this. The introduction of 19 more 7 is exciting because it does expand that law. It'll add, um, I guess it's a thousand, but I thought it was a little bit more as well than 1,000 buildings that will have to reduce their emissions. Also, solutions that address disparate unemployment due to COVID. I'm expired. Will be paired with this immediate need to address the climate crisis. Before intro 1947, local and 97 was projected to create like 40,000 jobs. Adding these buildings will add more jobs, which is especially important in this time of unemployment. So I'm expressing my strong support of introduction 1947, and um, I join the advocates, experts, and others that are expressing that support. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Michael Scott, who will be followed by Elizabeth McMillan. Time starts now. Sorry, I thought that uh, the host unmutes me. Um, Sonal just bolted through her presentation because we were all told we had three minutes. Now we find out we have two. So I'm going to scrap my whole speech and just basically tell you that I am uh, the energy committee head of the 60 Cooper Street Co-op and also a member of WE Act. Um, we have rent controlled tenants in our building, but we do not get the exemption because we're a co-op. And um, we've spent over $100,000 to comply with Local Law 97, and we are in full support of Local Law 97. Um, and I am very much in support of Introduction 1947, but I think it's extremely unfair that co-ops um, are having to pull 100% of our weight in Local Law 97, and that um, big landlords and developers do not. And they don't live here, we do. Um, we breathe the air here, and they don't. They get the tax, right? I mean, they get the exemptions, they're saving millions of dollars, and it's on our backs. And they don't really have any skin in the game, and I'm upset. I think it should, I'd like to see 100% compliance and we're perfectly willing to contribute and do our bit to save the planet and our neighborhoods. But um, I don't think it's right that um, big landlords and developers get a pass on this and we don't. So please, please um, support local law or the um, introduction one nine. Four, seven. Thank you. I'm expired. Thank you. Next, <clears throat> I will call on Elizabeth McMillan, who will be followed by Liv Yoon. Time starts now. Thank you for holding the hearing today and for the opportunity to testify regarding the introduction 1947, expanding the number of buildings in New York City that have to severely reduce their pollution. I am Elizabeth McMillan and I am a community member of WE Act for Environmental Justice. I am working with Sanal, who is a policy advocate, <laughs> advocacy coordinator at WE Act in support of introduction 1947, which will help to severely reduce the pollution here in Upper Manhattan. As a resident in Central Harlem, I am very concerned about our air quality. It is our understanding that buildings are responsible for two thirds of New York City's annual emissions. It's culprit, if I may say, in why I see a difference in easier breathing outside between the boroughs and a strain on my breathing here in Harlem. I also have seen a great increase 
in construction throughout Northern Manhattan, which adds to the increase in poor air quality. In addition to the urban heat island effect, that's especially central to our community due to some lack of trees, concrete, car emissions, and the intense temperature during hot and humid days. Other factors are smoking within apartments, which also increases the poor air quality that affects my breathing. Though smoking cessation is another issue that this bill does not solve, but it is a huge consideration when outside air pollution negatively affects me, then I have to come home to the same poor air quality within my building, including rent regulated buildings to shrink their carbon footprint in low income communities, I believe will be the step in the right direction. Air is provided by mother nature for free and is a right to all. My lungs deserve every right to benefit from cleaner air already provided by earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Now, <clears throat> I would call on Liv Yoon, who will be followed by Emma Yuofsky. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Constituencies and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding Introduction 1947. My name is Liv Yoon, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Earth Institute and the Maleness School of Public Health at Columbia University. I'm also a resident of West Harlem and a member of We Act for Environmental Justice. I'm testifying today to express a dire need for Introduction 1947 to expand the number of buildings in New York City that have to severely reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change is spinning out of control as we speak. Cutting down emissions is no longer a choice, but a must, an immediate must. Introduction 1947 would bolster Local Law 97 to guarantee rent-regulated buildings to shrink their carbon footprint, but not off the backs of tenants. This would add thousands of buildings to Local Law 97, about 15 to 20% of regulated buildings, resulting in a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the city. We need to remember that, we need to remember what this means in real life. Climate change is directly related to people's health. We're all in the same storm of the climate crisis, but we're not all in the same boats. Again and again, we see that people of color, of low income, are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. This means hotter summers in areas with less green space and homes with no AC. This means more of our neighbors dying in communities like Harlem. We need to connect these dots between building emissions and people's health so greenhouse gas emissions don't feel like mere numbers. New York City has to be a leader in this effort, and let's picture what this would signal. If a city as dense and as busy as New York City can cut down emissions, imagine what other cities around the country and the world will see as possible. We have an opportunity here to challenge a crisis of imagination. Sociologist Raymond Williams once said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not despair convincing. We have that opportunity here and now through this very concrete measure of Introduction 1947. Thank you for your time and efforts towards this goal. Thank, Thank you, you, Liv Yoon. Uh, and now I will call on Emma Yurovsky, who will be followed by Christopher Athenios. Time starts now. Hi, um, my name is Emma Yurovsky. I'm an undergraduate sustainable development student at Columbia University, a recently certified LEED Green Associate and a member of the community organization, We Act for Environmental Justice. Through my studies and work with We Act, I learned time and time again how crucial an environmental justice framework is in fostering healthy and equitable environments. In the face of a web of interconnected crises, such environments are increasingly out of reach for more and more New York City residents. Thank you for holding this hearing today and for allowing me the opportunity to testify before the New York City Council in support of introduction 1947. I am terrified of the climate crisis. The need to cut emissions, among many other mitigation and adaptation measures, has never been more urgent. It is not very common that an individual can have a say in how their city responds to climate change. So when this um, opportunity arose, I could not pass it up. Community involvement is key, and I'm here to advocate on, my, on behalf of my community and urge you, city council members, to vote yes on introduction 1947. Buildings are the single greatest source of greenhouse gas emissions in New York City. 
And as such, this sector has the greatest potential for emission reduction. Already, tens of thousands of buildings are subject to Local Law 97 and are making the mandatory changes needed to reduce emissions. However, because any building with one or more affordable housing units is exempt, communities that rely on such housing are not benefiting as directly from pollution reduction. By expanding Local Law 97 to include buildings with less than 35% affordable units, low-income residents can benefit from emission reductions in their homes and communities mm -hmm. without bearing the financial burden of making it happen. Making Introduction 1947 law will not only make New York City generally healthier, it will help facilitate a more equitable distribution of these health benefits. I am in full support of expanding the reach of Local Law 97 by passing Introduction 1947. Having more buildings subject to this emission regulation while also protecting low income residents from bearing the costs of a buy. Time expired. You can finish your thought. Okay. She's already signed up. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Uh, next. Okay. Next, we will hear from Christopher Athenios who will be followed by Nan Fessler. Time starts now. Hi, my name is uh, Christopher Athenaos. I'm a small property owner of uh, two buildings, which are over 25,000 square feet. And I'd like to voice my objection to intro uh, 1947, which would modify local law 97, um, because changing the definition of buildings which are subject to the law, specifically removing the exemption of buildings with at least one uh, rent regulated apartment would make it economically unfeasible for me to comply with the emissions reductions uh, required in Local Law 97. Uh, I'd like you to understand what my family has done to make these buildings more energy efficient over the last 40 years that we've owned these properties. We've uh, changed windows, roofs, <laughs> boilers, burners. We've installed solar panels on the roofs. Uh, more recently, over the last 20 years, with an, when an apartment would become vacant, we would remove the plaster walls in the apartment right to the bare brick and insulate all of the exterior walls in the apartment. Uh, this made a dramatic improvement in the heat retention in that specific apartment. However, we're not able to do that in long-term occupied apartments for obvious reasons. Uh, with the recent passage of HSTPA of 2019, all of our long-term plans to renovate apartments, which included these type of energy plans, such as insulating an apartment, came to a grinding halt since we're only permitted to get a rent increase on $15,000 of improvements every 15 years. This negligible amount cannot nearly cover such the cost of such energy improvements. Uh, we must deal with more pressing costs, such as lead paint abatement, plumbing and electrical upgrades, new windows, just to name a few. Uh, we're forced to make tough choices and unfortunately we can't do everything when our income is restricted. Uh, furthermore, we have to receive practically no rent increases from the Rent Guidelines Board over the last several years. These negligible increases, if any, don't cover our increased real estate taxes and water and sewer charges. Uh, quite frankly, um, we're even challenged with apartments that are not subject to rent regulation because the outer, in the outer boroughs, such as where I am in Brooklyn, um, we can't simply keep raising the rents on our on our uh, time expired tenants, uh, and especially now during. Okay, thank you. I think I lost, I think I lost your ability to, to, to keep going, but thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Nan Fessler, who will be followed by Rachel Landsberg. Time starts now. Great. My name is Dan Fessler. I am a tenant and I am a WEAC for Environmental Justice member. I live in Central Harlem, zip code 10037. That's District 9, uh, Bill Perkins District. We're also home to one of the highest concentrations of asthma in the city of New York. I want to thank the council and staff for allowing me to testify. And I do ask that the New York City Council pass intro 1947. The Trump administration is in total denial about climate change and science in general, as we have witnessed their non-leadership during COVID, this COVID-19 pandemic. And I am so grateful to the New York City Council in respecting science by passing progressive bills like Local Law 97. Recognizing that buildings in New York City are responsible for two thirds of its annual emissions of greenhouse gases, 
Local Law 97 addressed the need to reduce those greenhouse gases by 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. However, Local Law 97 has a huge loophole in that buildings over the 25,000 square feet that have one or more uh, affordable housing units would have been exempt. 1947, this new bill helps to erase that glaring exemption and, and since very progressive housing laws were passed in 2019 by the New York State Legislature where the MCIs aren't being able to be passed on the way they were before, intro 1947 makes so much sense as nearly 60% of the buildings in New York City would now be covered. This will guarantee rent regulated buildings shrink their carbon footprint, but not off the backs of tenants. We are seeing right in front of our eyes the damages in the U.S. due to climate change, the incredible wildfires on the West Coast, flooding in Alabama and Florida during, because of Hurricane Sally and now the Hurricane <clears throat> Beta. I am nearly 73 years old and I am not going to see the most horrific harmful effects. Time expired. Anyways, I say thank you to the council and I do hope that they pass the bill. It is a moral necessity. Thank you. Thank you, Nan Fessler. Um, uh, now I would like to welcome Rachel Landsberg, who will be followed by Phoebe Flaherty. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Rachel Landsberg. I've lived on the Upper West Side of New York City for over 20 years. I'm an educator, a mother, and I'm a proud member of WE Act for Environmental Justice. I would like to thank the members of the City Council for holding this hearing and for listening to the voices and stories of New Yorkers like me who love our city and want only the best for it and its residents. I am speaking in favor of intro 1947. I decided to testify today, a first for me, because as fires rage on the West Coast and hurricane season has already begun to wreak havoc on the Southern and Eastern coasts, the harrowing effects of climate change are on my mind daily. That coupled with coupled with the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on black, brown, and working class people has compelled me to take a stand whenever and wherever I can in working towards a more equitable society. It has never been more important to work to create a sustainable and just city where all New Yorkers can thrive. Intro 1947 would affect change in a just and equitable way that is important to me personally. By expanding the number of buildings that would need to reduce emissions, it would advance New York City's commitment to tackling climate change head on. In addition, intro 1947 would protect rather than penalize tenants who live in affordable housing. As we witness globally the disproportionate impact of climate change on frontline and vulnerable communities in the global south who bear the burden of climate change caused by nations in the global north, nations with power and money, we must recognize and take a stand on these issues within our own communities as well, where the same dynamic plays itself out. We must be bold in curbing greenhouse gas emissions while at the same time protecting vulnerable working New Yorkers who depend on affordable housing. Now is a time for leadership and forward thinking. New York must step up to do its part to combat climate change and those who have benefited I'm expired. greenhouse gases should do their part as well. We don't have time to wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel Landsberg. I would now like to call Phoebe Flaherty, who will be followed by Zachary Steinberg. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Phoebe Flaherty. I'm an organizer at Align, the Alliance for Greater New York. Align's a community labor coalition dedicated to creating good jobs, vibrant communities, and accountable democracy for all New Yorkers. We coordinate the Climate Works for All Coalition, a diverse coalition of labor unions, community, faith, environmental justice, and climate groups who have come together to move us towards a livable climate and fair economy through a just transition. And together with many of the orgs who have spoken here today already, um, we won the passage of Local Law 97 in 2019, the most ambitious buildings leg legislation in the world, which will move us aggressively towards our climate goals and create more than 40,000 jobs in the process. Intro 1947 will amend Local Law 97 to move us more aggressively and more equitably towards our emissions reductions goals, including buildings with fewer than 35% re 
regulated units under the mandate moving forward. And we predict that this means that more than a thousand large buildings will be required to make energy efficiency improvements according to the standards, meaning thousands more union planners, architects, electricians, and more will be put to work doing energy efficiency upgrades. Good union job creation is critical for our city now more than ever. New York City is in the middle of an economic crisis with our city's unemployment rate hovering around 20% and disproportionately impacting New York's black and brown communities. We need to be moving policies that create good career, family sustaining jobs in the climate sector now more than ever. Um, and passing intro 1947 will ensure that emissions are more quickly and drastically reduced across the city and that the localized benefits of retrofits like lower localized emissions and healthier and more comfortable living spaces occur more equitably across the city for lower income residents. And so we urge the Committee on Environmental Protection to support this amendment uh, to Local Law 97. Uh, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. I apologize for having to step away from the screen. My son had to be let back into the apartment. We're, we're still doing remote learning, so it's... Yep. Uh, an adventure. That's life these days. <laughs> yes. And now I'd like to welcome Zachary Steinberg, who will be followed by Margaret Perkins. Time starts now. Thank you. Revney shares the city's environmental goals and appreciates that the building sector collectively needs to make meaningful carbon reductions in order to reach these goals. While understanding the scope of this law is challenging, Revney believes that the thousands of buildings, many with a large percentage of rate regulated units, will be impacted by this legislation. We support data-driven public policy, particularly with our fellow New Yorkers, the city of New York, and our economy continuing to experience the challenges of the COVID pandemic. It is essential that the council undertake a much more rigorous analysis of this proposed legislation. Any expansion of local carbon reduction mandates must be reflective of buildings' physical and financial realities, particularly now in a moment of economic downturn. COVID and its economic fallout has impacted property owners and tenants alike. Indeed, rental vacancies in the city have reached a 14-year high in June of this year, and the number only continues to climb. With recent lapses in rent payments combined by, with, with owners offering uh, concessions to tenants, buildings are losing out on the income they need to cover operational expenses, mortgage payments, labor costs, and capital improvements. This is particularly true for buildings with rent-regulated units. This is not to say that all buildings with rent-regulated units have no ability to make improvements. Rather, it simply reflects the fact that a meaningful analysis needs to be undertaken to determine the impact of this legislation on buildings and their residents, whether the unit is rent regulated or it is market rate, so that those buildings have a, have a diminished ability to do this work can be better supported. Should this legislation move forward, additional action is necessary, including outreach and more meaningful programs to help buildings comply. In addition, those in the absence of more aggressive public programs, those struggling with existing operating expenses would potentially be 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 likely to pass on the cost of retrofits onto market rate units, driving up those rents. I want to point out that buildings covered by intro 1947 will have substantially less time to come into compliance with these mandates than the larger building owners who became subject to these caps almost 18 months ago. For this reason, and given the financial realities facing buildings today, the council should strongly consider waiving or delaying financial penalties for buildings with rent regulated units during the time period. expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next, we'll hear from Margaret Perkins, who will be followed by Joseph Chara. Time starts now. Um, my name is Margaret Perkins, and I'm a member of 350 NYC, and we've been very involved. Uh, for about three years now for the passage of the um, Local Law 97 and now hopefully 1947. Uh, 1947 will expand the number about a uh, number of large buildings, uh, uh, another thousand uh, and add to the 50,000 that were covered under the original Local Law 97. Uh, this is indeed a daunting challenge uh, the goal is to reduce emissions from large buildings by 40% by 2030. But we feel New York City is up to the challenge, even in these difficult times of the coronavirus pandemic. But it will require the full support of the council, council members, the real estate industry, financial institutions, unions, tenants and homeowners. Although we know, we see today that some council members 
are uh, talking uh, are very cautious about pressing forward with local law 97 due to the pandemic. But we say the opposite is true. There will only be a rapid and just recovery in this city if we generate good paying jobs now. And local law 97 has the potential to do that. Uh, Urban Green Council estimates that we will require 140,000 jobs by 2030. And these will be good paying jobs uh, that will stimulate the economy. If all buildings choose efficiency to meet the carbon caps by 2030, Urban Green Council estimates that the market will be between 16 and 24 billion, a great opportunity for New York City. Um, the new law could trigger a 13 fold increase in today's annual market, depending on how soon owners begin to invest in their properties. Time so expired. support the bill okay <laughs> thank you for your testimony okay uh, i would now like to welcome joseph para who will be followed by chris half -Knight. time starts now good afternoon esteemed members of the committee my name is joseph charup and i am the director of horticulture at greenwood cemetery we are a national historic landmark in a 478 acre green space in the heart of brooklyn and the heart of council member Menchaca's district Determining the cause of the extreme weather events that are ravaging this country and the world on a near weekly basis is not rocket science. They are caused by extreme heat, the result of climate change. As greenhouse gas emissions are the most significant driver of climate change, I applaud the commitment of this bill to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in New York City. We at Greenwood are also committed to slowing the effects of climate change in New York City. I'd like to share with you briefly an outline of the work we're doing that aligns with the goals of this committee in the hope that there are opportunities for collaboration and sharing information and strategies. The Greenwood Cemetery has partnered with the School of Integrated Plant Science at Cornell University to promote biodiversity and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Brooklyn green spaces, including at Greenwood, by studying and testing mowing practices and grass management strategies that will act as a model for the city and the potential forming of an urban grasslands institute. We are seeking to create applied real world solutions to fight climate change through smarter management of grass and turf, a massive but almost always overlooked component of greenhouse gas emissions. 18% of New York City is covered in grass, approximately 34,560 acres. It takes over half a million gallons of gasoline to mow New York City's grass every seven days, releasing 10 million pounds of carbon dioxide annually. If we were just to stretch this to 10 days, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. It's that simple. We can make a difference. Now is the time that we must rethink the way the, way the vast acreage of turf grass in the city is managed. At Greenwood, we are developing new strategies to manage the turf in urban green spaces that effectively and sustainably address short and long-term needs for a changing climate. These progressive data-driven strategies and novel management models will emphasize alternatives to energy and chemical intensive management mowing and herbicides. If the strategies that we're developing at Greenwood are adopted citywide, which is our hope, they will have a measurable impact on the resilience of our urban environment. Thank you for your time. Greenwood welcomes the opportunity to work with the committee. I'm um, expired. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Um, okay, I'd now like to welcome Chris Halfnight, who will be followed by Samantha Wilt. Time starts now. There we go. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chris Halfnight. I am Associate Director of Policy at Urban Green Council, a nonprofit dedicated to transforming buildings for a sustainable future. My testimony today is also supported by the Environmental Defense Fund, who could not appear. We support Intro 1947 because it would align Local Law 97 with revisions to the state's rent laws, and because it would yield greater carbon savings by leaving fewer buildings behind. The first point is straightforward, as we've heard the definition of rent regulated and the prescriptive compliance path in Local Law 97 were calibrated to the state's rent laws in effect at the time, specifically to avoid passing retrofit costs to rent regulated tenants. By updating the definition and thus the eligibility for the prescriptive path to match the state's new 35% threshold, this amendment would conform to state law, it would put similar buildings on a level playing field, and most importantly, it would preserve the spirit and intent of Local Law 97. 
To my second point, this amendment will have significant carbon impact. Urban Green estimates that about a quarter, 25% of all GHG emissions under Local Law 97 come from buildings with at least one rent regulated unit. Under the prescriptive path that these buildings have currently, they will implement low cost energy saving measures that over time simply won't yield the emission savings we need to hit the city's targets. Maybe more importantly, the tenants in these buildings will miss out on the co-benefits that come with deeper energy efficiency like better air quality. As we heard, the data is limited in this sector, but there's no doubt this amendment would shift a significant number of rent regulated buildings from the prescriptive path to carbon intensity caps potentially more than a thousand. That will yield larger emission savings and local benefits while still guarding against affordability impacts. At the same time, we recognize that many building owners will need meaningful assistance from the city in order to comply, particularly in the affordable housing sector, particularly right now, given- I'm expired. Public health and economic challenges. So we strongly urge the city to double down on expanding support programs for deep energy retrofits. Thank you. Councilmember Menchaca, and I see you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, time starts now. For this panel, I just want to say thank you to Greenwood for testifying. I don't know if they're still here, um, but I was at Greenwood this weekend and yeah, yeah. and saw the uh, the fields, the the testing fields that he was talking about in terms of the the changing of the mowing and. Um, I was I was looking forward to the testimony today, and I think it's just a great example. So I just want to say thank you for everything that Greenwood does. It's a massive piece of property, and it's just another example of a true partnership and how every one of us are going to have to create a very unique approach. But we're all trying to get to the same place. And so, and thank you to all the other folks who have testified so far. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chaka. And now I would like to welcome Samantha Wilk, who will be followed by Carlos Castel Croak. Time starts now. Uh, we're not getting her testimony through. Oh. Now. There we go. Sorry. Now we got you. Okay. <laughs> it's so great to see you, Chairman and Council members and all other fantastic folks who have been testifying. Um, it's so exciting. It's Climate Week. Thank you all again for your extraordinary leadership on this issue um, from passing um, the Climate Leadership Act last year. Um, as others have mentioned, you know, the idea of a national climate policy at this point is like completely obliterated and every day they further undermine it. So having New York City as really a bright light leading on this issue, which is, of course, more obvious and devastating to this country um, than ever. So thank you again for all of your work on this um, for years and years. Um, as others have said, and as we had said at our initial um, testimony for uh, Local Law 97, the more buildings we cover, the more carbon we save. Um, that's incredibly important. I know we haven't all seen specific analysis, although Chris just had some good numbers, and I know Mr. Chambers also um, presented some, um, but, uh, you know, last year we it, it looked like one third of the emissions from covered buildings under lo Local Law 97. Um, uh, would have been exempted about a third. So we hope the missing reductions um, now get covered through 1947. So we strongly encourage um, that you all pass it. Um, and as others have said also, um, including the buildings does get us more carbon savings, which is incredibly important, but most, most importantly, it gives these tenants and these buildings the benefits of energy efficiency. Um, um, and these buildings are often those that need um, the efficiency upgrades the most and house, often house tenants that would greatly benefit from the resulting indoor air quality and health benefits, along with the lower energy and operating costs. Um, so we, we're confident that intro 1947 will improve the climate and other pollution reduction outcomes of local law 97, while also delivering critical protections of these tenants against displacement and maintaining- I'm expired. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony as well. Good to see you. And next we'll hear from <clears throat> Carlos Castel Croak, who will be followed by Annie 
Ganerva. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs of the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing the sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chair Constantinides for the opportunity to testify today. When the New York City Council passed Local Law 97 early last year, it laid the cornerstone of the city's ambitious goal of reducing emissions 80% by the year 2050. At that time, NYLCV and other stakeholders understood that there was still a lot of work to be done in order to ensure that this law is properly implemented, provides in clear, a clear and achievable regulatory framework, and is adequately enforced and invested in. This law also did not include all the buildings that must ultimately be more energy efficient to achieve the city's climate goals. NYLCV supports the passage of intro 1947 because it applies local law 97 to buildings that cannot be overlooked if we are to reach our 80 by 50 goal. Intro 1947 will amend the city charter and administrative code as it relates to rent regulated accommodations in order to bring local law 97 in accordance with the state law. Applying a threshold of at least 35% reg rent regulated units to the local law 97 exemption will ensure that critical buildings are not left behind and that we can start working to achieve 80 by 50. While we believe Intro 1947 is a necessary amendment to the Local Law 97, we also understand that there is still an insufficient number of programs and funds available to help building owners adapt to these new standards. We're excited to see Local Law 97 working, working group uh, develop the groundbreaking re regulatory standards that will bring New York City to the front lines of climate change mitigation, but the city must also provide the tools necessary for these standards to be met. NYLCV will continue to advocate for programs, incentives, and funds that will provide building owners with the means to metroprint their properties with energy saving and emission reducing technology. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. And finally, we will hear from Annie Gorneva. Annie. Time starts now. Thank you, and thank you for attacking me on last minute. I super appreciate it. Uh, my name is Annie Garniva, and today I come to you wearing two hats that are central to this bill and issue as an activist against fossil fuel infrastructure and environmental justice and renewable energy through Sane Energy Project and the Stop the Williams Pipeline Coalition, and as the Director of Communication and Member Services at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. COVID-19 and the economic crisis created have shown us the deep cracks and instabilities that have long existed in our local economy. Too many New Yorkers have been trying for too long to survive in low-wage jobs with few safety supports, long and unstable schedules, and few career opportunities. It is our city's leader's responsibility to empower communities that have been hardest hit by this pandemic and the systemic marginalization and disinvestment that existed prior to it with 21st century careers that will build economic, social, and climate resilience across the five boroughs. This is why we at the Employment and Training Coalition support Intro 1947, which would create thousands more quality jobs for low and moderate income communities of color in the energy efficiency sector. This would have the wonderful double pronged outcome of building economic and environmental power and stability in our communities, something that is long overdue. While there are already many trained and in training low and moderate income workers in New York City that will be able to take advantage of the jobs created by this bill, especially in construction, the creative and management roles in design and renovation are still lacking in terms of diversity and accessibility. The city must put its money where its mouth is and provide deep investments in education and training programs in design, renovation, and construction so that our communities can turn their talents into the skills and credentials necessary to access energy efficiency careers. Without this step, the jobs created will go to those that already have a leg up on economic opportunity and will continue to drive the gentrification and displacement we've seen over the last two decades. This is why we desperately need holistic solutions like this introduction as well as the Green New Deal that tackle the root systemic fault lines in our society. I'm expired. Justice is environmental justice and is economic justice. Um, so again, we urge you to pass this bill, not just for the environmental reasons, but also the economic reasons and follow up uh, with more and deeper investments that will actually connect people to the job, not just talk about the jobs in name only. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask if there's anyone who has registered to testify, but whose name has not been called. Uh, if, if so, raise your hand. 
Uh, seeing none, I'll turn it over to Costa, Chair Constanides, for any uh, closing remarks. I want to thank uh, all of those who gave of their time today to testify both in support and in not support of the bill. I appreciate everyone's time and, uh, and interest in this topic. Uh, I want to thank all of the staff, again, Samara Swanston, Nadia Johnson, Ricky Chawla, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, my staff, uh, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, Terrence Cullen, all of the sergeant at arms, all the technical staff that have made this hearing possible. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for their good uh, participation. And of course, thank the administration as well. And of course, our speaker, Corey Johnson, uh, who I know who was at the rally earlier today. Uh, you know, this, the Local 197 was the largest emissions reduction policy, not just in New York City, but a hit city in the world. Uh, we need to continue to build on that success. We need to bring more buildings uh, into compliance uh, and we need to act on climate uh, with the urgency that it deserves. We may have a president who doesn't believe in climate change. Hopefully that will change on November 3rd. Um, but what's not changing is the reality of climate change, the way it impacts our city, the way it impacts uh, you know, our, our environmental justice communities, our communities of color, our low income neighborhoods. Uh, and especially in the age of COVID, when uh, those same communities are being decimated by health impacts, they're also wondering if their houses are going to flood. Uh, they're all also wondering are they gonna be able to get out of their apartment because of high heat. Um, they're wondering if where they're living is going to exist in the next 50 years. And those are all very sobering thoughts. Um, so I am glad to be working with everyone here to make these bills a reality and to continue our march to a more sustainable, more just city. Uh, so with that, I will um, thank Gavel this hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed and uh, appreciate everyone's efforts. Thank you. Bye, Costa. Bye, Samara. We good to sign off? Is everything, I know it's still taping, are we?